Fun fact. In 1942, the British government chose an island off the coast of northwestern Scotland as a test site for mass anthrax experiments. Under the code name Operation Vegetation, they dropped bombs full of deadly bacteria all over the surface of the island. Not so fun fact. Bacleus anthracus is a spore-forming bacteria. This means it can form a shell around itself that allows it to remain dormant for decades and under the right conditions, even centuries. And who did His Majesty's government test their weapons on? The British government imported 80 sheep to the island, and that's because anthrax can be transferred to humans from animals through direct contact. And in 1940s Europe, sheep-human contact was a far more common occurrence. The intended goal of the UK government was never to directly infect humans, but to spread spores around the German countryside that would cling to the grass and then infect the livestock that would then go on to infect people. Not the best. There's a reason why we now have laws against chemical warfare. Within a day of exposure, all the sheep on the island were dead and their bodies were buried under literal tons of stone to prevent any infection. As far as the crown was concerned, the experiment was a success. But the end result was an island full of not only dead sheep, but deadly bacteria. The island was closed off from the public and the government tried to forget about it. But in the 1980s, after 40 years of government inaction, an eco-action group called the Dark Harvest Commandos began to demand that the government decontaminate the island. Until their demands were met, they began sending contaminated soil from the island to government buildings, going so far as to send a sample to a town hosting a conference presided over by then Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. You might have heard of her. The British government got the message, and later that decade, in 1986, the process of decontamination began. By 1998, the island was considered no longer quarantined, but I still don't know if you'd want to take any chances visiting it, though. Greenard Island, Scotland is just one example of an island that's forbidden. The idea of forbidden islands is a favorite device of fantasy and adventure books, and these islands are usually forbidden because they contain a reclusive wizard or a plain swatting gorilla. In real life, these places are secluded from us for a variety of reasons. Some biological, like Grinnard, and some social. But just because these reasons are more boring doesn't make them any less interesting. Mark your maps, drop the main sail, because today we're looking at the weird world of real-life forbidden islands. On the western side of the Hawaiian archipelago, there's a small, dry island called Ni'ihau. Unlike Grinnard, Ni'ihau is inhabited. But while the inhabitants of the island are technically US citizens, it doesn't resemble any other place in the country. Fun fact. In 1863, before the United States annexation of Hawaii, Scottish landowner Elizabeth Sinclair bought the island from King Kamehameha IV for $10,000, roughly $163,000 in today's money. But the purchase required that Sinclair swear an oath, an oath that she and her successors would preserve Hawaiian culture on the island. And in a very rare historical incident, the would-be colonizers kept their word. A seclusion policy was established that endures to this day. The island's isolation has preserved a way of life that would otherwise be lost. The population now stands below 200 people, and there's no telephone service, no paved roads, and no hotels. And the primary language is still Hawaiian. Regular travel to the island is almost universally prohibited, but recently, small excursions have been allowed into Ni'ihau, but even then, people are mainly only allowed to visit a single section of beach or a few reefs surrounding the island. While Ni'ihau is forbidden to keep its unique culture preserved, Ilhada Camada Grande off the coast of Brazil is forbidden for your own safety. And if you're wondering why, maybe the island's nickname of Snake Island will clear that up. Not the funnest fact. Previous estimates put the island's snake population density at one snake per square meter. That's about one snake for every step you take. When you're out and about, telling the difference between a venomous and a non-venomous snake can mean the difference between life and death. Most people will point at a snake's head shape to tell if it's venomous or not. Non-venomous snakes generally have soft circular heads, and venomous snakes generally have sharp arrow-like heads. And this is true with the vipers like the ones on Snake Island. The most iconic species on Snake Island is the critically endangered gold Golden Lancehead, which is found exclusively on Ilhada Camada Grande. The lancehead became trapped on the island during the last ice age as the ocean levels rose rapidly, and without any natural predators and a steady diet of birds, the population boomed. In the early 20th century, the island gained its Portuguese nickname of the Island of the Big Burn, when locals tried to burn a patch of the jungle to create a banana plantation and a lighthouse. However, the snakes overwhelmed the farmers, which led to the Brazilian army closing off the island to civilians in the 1920s. Only scientists are allowed to visit the island now for research. And recent population models, while high, say there's probably nowhere near as many snakes as the previous one snake per square meter estimates. North Brother Island is a strange speck of green in the middle of New York's East River off the coast of the Bronx. The island has an ominous reputation as the location of one of the many 20th century isolated contagious disease hospitals, which were common in the era. The island started as a smallpox hospital, but soon would expand to treat typhoid and tuberculosis. The infamous Mary Mallon, better known as typhoid Mary spent the last years of her life there from 1915 to 
1938. The diseases treated on North Brother Island were incredibly deadly in their time and incredibly difficult to cure. The loss of life is unimaginable. Around the turn of the century, the best solution in many cases was to isolate the patient from the rest of the public and hope the disease wouldn't spread. All of these diseases were largely eradicated in America with vaccines and the advent of modern sanitation measures like chlorinated water, better antibiotics, and better antivirals, ending the need for isolated island hospitals. For a while thereafter, North Brother Island became home to veterans returning from World War II until the 1950s when a center for drug addiction treatment was set up. The facility was so notoriously bad and brutal, it was closed down in 1963, and the island has stayed abandoned since then. Now it's largely home to shorebirds and urban explorers who go to see the ruins of the hospital and the tuberculosis pavilion. Travelers to North Brother Island should be careful though. Most of the buildings are in a state of active collapse, and the New York City government has discouraged anyone from going there for their own safety. Today, access to the island is tightly controlled by City Hall. At the end of the day, while the allure of forbidden islands may always call to something deep inside of us, curious to know what's on the other shore, all of these places are forbidden for a good reason. Whether it's life or death, or an issue of respecting the inhabitants of the island, some places are better to look at from a distance rather than close up. Good luck on your next adventures, and stay safe out there.